God, we give you thanks for the time that you have given us here. We ask, oh Lord, that you bless this Bible study, our oh God, and it will be fruitful. Dear Lord God, that we would learn from the book of Romans, Lord, all that Paul intended for us to understand concerning the gospel. So we ask, oh Lord, that you teach us this morning as we look into your word to have a clear, concise understanding of the book of Romans. Help us, Lord, to see the, the logic, Lord God, the coherence of it, and how it fun functions together as a whole in a book, O oh Lord God. So we thank you for your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, so let's, um, we, we, we're going to begin our Bible study hour again. Today it is on the book of Romans. We are studying the book of Romans in the, our study of the New Testament, and we are using the book, The Message of the New Testament by Dr. Mark Dever. And what we are looking here this morning is one of the most, if not the most, theological, treat, important theological treatises of the gospel. And in some cases, it can be argued as the most important one. Some scholars look at the canonical position of Romans as well in our English Bibles. The four Gospels, if you remember, if you look at your Bibles, right, we have the Gospels, then we have Acts, and then we have Romans. We have the four Gospels, which is a theological biography of the life of Christ. Then we have the book of Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, which is a historical account of the apostolic preaching of the said theological biography or the life of Christ. But then we have Romans, which follows, that is a theological explanation, application, and exhortation of the Gospels. So, you know what, let me put it on the board so we have an idea, right? So we have the Gospels, right? Then we have Acts, but then we have Romans. The New Testament begins with the Gospels, about who Jesus Christ is. The book of Acts explains, they, they proclaim the message about this person. But here we have Romans functioning as an explanation, or a theological explanation of all about the life of Christ by bringing together what we see in the Old Testament. Because in the book of Romans, you would see Old Testament allusions, you would see references to Israel, you would see explanations and prophecies being fulfilled concerning the person of Christ. So it's a very deep theological book, but we wouldn't be able to exhaust all of that this morning. The book of Romans is just we're going to take a simple approach to it and see the major themes that the Apostle Paul covers in it and how it functions as a whole. Good? All right. So if you have the book itself, the message of the New Testament by Dr. Deva, we are on page 150. If not, I will just read it for you. And in your handouts, I have the, the author, date, and purpose. And we'll go straight to that, and then we'll go into the book. So, the author is Paul, obviously, but did he actually do the writing of the book of Romans? Turn with me to Romans 16.22, and we'll actually see who wrote the book of Romans. Romans 16 and verse 22, last chapter, 16 and verse 22. It says, I, Tertius, who, wrote the, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. So by hand, who wrote the book of Romans? It was Tertius. So Paul was dictating it, and we have Tertius, who was the, what we call the amanuensis, or secretary, who would have been writing what Paul told him to write. You all get that? Now it was written probably around AD 57, near the end of Paul's life, according to Dr. Deva in on page 150, right? If you flip the, the handout over, I added one more entry, the newest entry, in key terms used in Bible study, AD and BC. So you just flip the page and you'll see AD, BC. Just for us to know, AD means Anno Domini. It's the Latin for in the year of our Lord, based on the estimated date of the birth of Jesus Christ. And that's the dating system that we use. BC simply means before Christ, and it is used in the Gregorian calendar. A pope appointed someone to estimate the date of when Christ was born, and that's how we get the dating, our, our dating system. All right? Okay, good. So written, the date it was written was probably around AD 57. What is the purpose of the book? Let's read. Why did Paul write the letter? Why did he write the letter to the Romans? Christians have commonly use this letter sort of as Paul's systematic theology, a timeless classic and a statement of the Christian faith and particularly of the gospel. 
It is easy to approach Romans like this, in part because Paul does not address specific situations or controversies as he does in the letters to the Corinthians or Galatians. While it is true that Romans is a classic statement of the Christian faith, it is not simply a list of unconnected propositions. So he doesn't just throw a list of teachings together at random. He's going to make connected points that compound on each other. And we'll see that in this outline here. He makes a sustained argument that explains the Christian gospel. And he uses the argument to introduce himself and to, his, to address his readers as in any personal letter. Specifically, he writes to thwart any Judaizing tendencies in which circumcision and Jewish customs are confused with the gospel. He writes to diffuse any tension that might arise between the Jewish and Gentile believers. And he writes to address the question that burns in his soul, the fate of his own people, the Jews. In some ways, this last purpose seems to be the driving force behind the letter to the Romans. Now, this is still in the book here. We are outside of the handout now. Obviously, we cannot cover everything Paul does in this letter. Yet, if we wanted to sum up the letter with one word, I would suggest the word justification. Justification, as it is popularly, popularly used, is a defense for why something is the way it is. We often use the word today negatively in the sense of an excuse. Oh, you're just trying to justify yourself. This means you are trying to accept, explain away something you know is wrong. In the New Testament, however, and in the history of Christian thought, the idea of justification refers more particularly to the question, how can a person be right with God? To be justified is to be declared right before God. And, the, and that is the first question Paul addresses in this letter. How can sinners be, be justified in the eyes of God? So that's what the book of Romans is about. And he uses one word to summarize the entire book, which is justification. Now what Dr. Dever does for us here is that he divides the book into two major sections, chapters 1 to 11, and then chapters 12 through 16. But then he breaks down chapters 1 to 8 in two sections. He calls it the justification of sinners in the eyes of God, the justification of sinners in the eyes of God. That's chapters 1 through 8. And then chapters 9 through 11, he calls it the justification of God in the eyes of sinners. So on one hand, we have the justification of sinners in the eyes of God, and then we have the justification of God in the eyes of sinners. That's how he breaks down the first 11 chapters. That first block on the justification of sinners in the eyes of God, he has six statements. One, all need to be justified because all sin. Two, none will be justified by what they do. Three, sinners can be justified only because of Christ's person and work. Four, sinners will only be justified through faith in Christ. Fifthly, all kinds of sinners can be justified. And sixth, justification is by faith alone, but justifying faith is never alone. What he means by that, if you are saved, certainly a godly life must follow that. That's what he's saying there. Then in the second block, the justification of God in the eyes of sinners, people would look at God and be like, God electing those whom he would save? How can we justify that? Is God unfair in salvation? And Dr. Glover gives four statements concerning justifying God in the eyes of sinners. One, God himself has remained faithful. Israel was unfaithful. Two, God has always worked by calling sinners to faith. Three, God has not changed whom he intends to save. And four, God has always acted for one ultimate purpose, his name's sake. That's the summary of the entire chapter that Dr. Glover covers in this book concerning Romans. What I am going to do this morning is extract information from this chapter and apply it to what we have here in the handout, in these five blocks that make up the book of Romans. This is a simple outline that I, 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 I derived so we could follow Paul's line of logic. So let's head back now to the handout. We see five S's which represent the theme of each block or section. They are key verses that highlight the themes in the respective chapters. So as we see chapters 1 to 3 and verse 20, it's all about the theme of sin. Then chapters 3 to 5, salvation and so forth. 
Paul's line of argumentation is logical and it can be seen as compounding successively. Let's, 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 let's make some sense out of that. So we have the issue of sin, right? In the first three chapters, the issue of sin. What is the solution to sin? Salvation. That's covered here. What follows our salvation? Sanctification, godly life. What is all of this based on? The sovereignty of God. God is the one who is sovereign salvation, and as a result of that, all of this occurs. And what follows salvation and the sovereignty of God in salvation, what should follow the, in the Christian life? We serve God. Now, what does Romans 12 and verse 1 say? And that's, we can just use that one verse to cover all of this. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, brethren, by the mercies of God, to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Good? All right. So, we're going to look at the first block now on sin. We need to justify this theme of sin. So now Paul is going to talk about that in the first three chapters. So the first person, Genevieve, if you could take chapters 1, and you're reading from 1, verse five, 1 to 1, verse 5 and 16 through 17. There's something very important here I need for us to see, especially in verse 16 to 17. Go ahead. Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, mm -hmm. which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. All right, so hold up. So the first thing that we observed here that Paul, he is saying that he is set apart for what purpose? For the gospel of God, to proclaim the gospel. And verse 2 says, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, referring to the Old Testament, that it pointed forward to Christ. When Christ opened his eyes, he realized that it was all pointing forward to Jesus. And this is what Paul is going to proclaim now. Go to verse 6, 15 through um, 17. Verse 16, right? Yeah, verse 16, yeah, sorry. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from, the f from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Okay, so verse 16, we see something very important here, a theme that we have to keep in mind as we're going to deal with the first block of sin. So we see Paul appointed as an apostle for the gospel, but then we see that he say that he's not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to every, everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then the Greek. So we have the Jew, I want to write that down, Jew and Gentile. Oh, I don't mind my handwriting, right? We have the Jew and the Gentile. That refers to everyone. But this theme of Jew and Gentile, because remember initially the word of God, the law of God came to the Jews first in letter and also God revealing himself to them. But now Paul is saying it is the, the gospel is for who? Everyone, the Jew and the Gentile. And this Jew and Gentile reconciliation is what we will see throughout the book. Continue again, Genevieve. Verse 18 through 20. God's judgment on sin. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness mm -hmm. and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. All right, so hold right there. So we see no one has excuse, and verse 19 says, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, 
have been clearly seen, understood, so that no one was, is without excuse. So everyone knows that God exists. God exists and no one is with excuse. So we're going to build on this here that we've seen a serious problem here. The gospel is for everyone. Everyone knows that God exists and there's no excuse and they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We have a serious problem here. And what is the outcome of that? Because they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Read the next, the next two verses, 24 and 28. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. Mm -hmm. so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Right, so what does that talk about there? The judgment of God. You all get that? So we have Jew and Gentile gospel for everyone. God exists, nobody has an excuse. And then... As a result of suppressing the truth in unrighteousness and continuing in sin, it resulted in the judgment of God. Okay, next one. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Right, so whole straight. You all seen that? What did we see in chapter 1 and verse 16? I am not ashamed of the gospel. But it's the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He's coming back here and he's going to talk about them again. Go ahead. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Mm -hmm. For there is no partiality with God. Right. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge Just. the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Right, so hold up there. So we see now in verse 11, there is no partiality with God. All have the law, the Jew and the Greek. The Gentile has the law written on their hearts. They act instinctively with the law. So all are under the judgment of God. God does not disparage between the Jew or the Gentile. Right? Okay, good. Let's leave out 25 and 29 because I think we made it clear that it's both Jew and Gentile who are under the judgment of God. Continue now to chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, and we'll wrap up this block. What then? Are, they, are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and, and Greeks, Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. Right. Continue. And go to 19 and 20, yeah. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Right, so we have the law of God holds all men accountable, right? Both Jew and, both Jew and Gentile, meaning all men. No one has an excuse. For by works of the law, no flesh will be justified because no one could keep the perfect law of God. Okay, so let's go back to, to Dr. Devon now as he speaks about this block here. Here's what he says. All need to be justified because of this major problem here. God exists. We all suppress the truth and unrighteousness. There's no excuse for it. The judgment of God comes and the law of God was given to hold us accountable so that we have no excuse before him. Here's what Dr. Deva says in the first block here. Paul teaches that all of us need to be justified because all of us have sinned. 
This is what he argues in the first three chapters of Romans. That's what we just went through here. In chapter 1, he refers to the godlessness and wickedness of men. Humanity is inexcusably guilty because God has revealed himself and his qualities in the, na in the natural world, and humanity has rejected the revelation. Jew and Gentile alike are addressed here, not just the Jews who had the Mosaic law. All mankind are described as idolaters who pursue debauchery, and he gives a list of increasingly horrible sins that incurs the righteous judgment of God. So we see the sin problem, a very big problem. All men are sinners before God, and the law of God exposes man's sin. We come now to the second block on salvation. Who has the script? Go ahead. Romans 3, 21 to 24. Yeah. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the rede redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Right. Now here's a question to ask. God's law is perfect and it is eternal. Can any human being in their sinful state keep the law of God perfectly? No, they can't. And since God's law is eternal, the law of God is eternal, if you break an eternal law, do you get a temporary consequence or an eternal consequence? The punishment must fit the crime, right? So therefore, nobody could keep that perfectly. But Paul comes here in, chapter, in verse 21 of chapter 3, and what does he say? But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has manifested, being witnessed by who? The law and the prophets, which refers to the Old Testament, even the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God has been witnessed by the law and the prophets through faith in who? Jesus Christ, for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, no Jew or Gentile. Who is the one who keeps the law of God righteously, who brings forth the righteousness of God? Verse 22, faith in who? Jesus Christ, for all have sinned, Jew and Gentile. The theme of Jew and Gentile continues. And we're here in salvation now. So the key person for salvation, for justification and righteousness, for justification and righteousness is in the person who? Jesus Christ. So we have salvation, which is the solution to the sin problem, for Christ is the one who perfectly keeps the righteousness of God, the righteous requirement of the law. And how do we obtain that righteousness? Through, the key word there is, faith, verse 22, through faith in Jesus Christ. And it simply means trusting in him, believing in Jesus Christ. That's what faith is. So we have justification by faith. We're moving to the book of Romans here. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, verses 2 to 5. Mm -hmm. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Verses 9 to 11. Right, so, but before we go any further, Abraham was justified by what? By faith. He, it was credited to him. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as favor, but as what is due, verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Now, listen to this. What Paul speaks of in chapter 4 is concerning Abraham, to show how Abraham was justified by faith. Circumcision is the sign of you being set apart unto God. But Abraham received justification before his circumcision. So it wasn't based on works. It was based on solely trusting in God's word. And that is why Abraham was justified by faith. That's why it says here, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now credit is very important too because how many of us here ever asked for credit to your phone? When you have no credit on your phone. Some people have done that before, right? It means that you're bankrupt. You don't have any. 
No, and in this case here, bankruptcy and righteousness. And Abraham had the righteousness credited to him. He was without it, and because he believed in God, it was credited to him. So we have Abraham, our, fourth, our, our, our father of the faith, who is the example of our justification. For just as he trusted in God without works for salvation, in the same way we trust in Christ for our salvation without any works. We are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. Amen? Why? Because as we saw in chapter 3, Christ fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law. All right, continue. Um, first of all. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without circums being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. All right, I'll go to the last block. The last one, verse 22. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. So we see the distinction here. We see it was faith in God as to why Abraham was justified. And he's saying here, therefore, it was also credited to him, verse 22, that is Abraham as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it, which meaning righteousness, will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. And why was Jesus raised from the dead? He was delivered over because of our transgressions, and he was raised for our justification. When we trust in Christ alone for salvation, his righteousness is credited to us, and therefore we are justified by faith. That's the second block, salvation. So we see the salvation that we have in Christ is the solution to the sin problem that was highlighted before. All right, so we are pressed for time, so we want to jump straight now to the third block, which is on sanctification. And this is what follows our justification. It's the product of our salvation. We are no longer a slave to sin. That's Pastor, Pastor Amrish. Chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. Or shall we who died to sin still live in it? Yeah, 12. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to right. God. So hold on right there. So we see so the sin problem being dealt with in salvation. And what proceeds from that, Paul says in chapter 6 and verse 1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin? Since we have been saved, should we continue in sin that grace may have increased? And he says, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And then he says in verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, but present yourselves to God. You have been freed from the slavery of sin. Now present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. So we cannot continue in sin. Chapter 7. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I, I myself with my mind, I'm serving the law of God. But on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Okay, good. Just hold up right there. So what Paul is talking about here is that even though we are saved and we are, just, we are to proceed in giving over our members as instruments of righteousness, he acknowledges, and this is very important here, that we must be aware that we at the same time while we are, sa we are saved, we are saints, the presence of sin remains in the human body. Our sinful bodies carry sin. So as Luther puts it, simul justus et peccator, that's Latin for we are simultaneously sinners and saints. And this is what he says here. Look at verse 21. I find that then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. It's a conflicting thing there. On the one hand, we have that we want to do good, but there's the battle and the ongoing desire to continue in sin. So that's the struggle that we will carry on for the rest of our lives till we depart and be in, we go to be with God. Chapter eight. Chapter 8. There is, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. 13. Uh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if, you, if by the spirit you are put into death, the deeds of the body you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption, a son by which we cry out, Abba, Father. All right. So let's just think about that for a second. Not only do we have salvation, now in sanctification we acknowledge that we are simultaneously sinners, but yet saints, but Paul is also saying that we have been given the ultimate resource for overcoming our sin, the means of overcoming our sin. And what's the means of overcoming our sin? Verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. How do we put to death the deeds of the flesh? In our sanctification, which is the ongoing battle that we covered in chapter 6 and 7. Look at verse 13, but if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live for all who are being led by the spirit of god these are the sons of god so certainly by the means of the work of the holy spirit in your life you are able to overcome the sin and present your members to god as instruments for righteousness which is the product or the outworking of the salvation which dealt with your sin problem that redeemed you from slavery to sin and you are no longer slave to sin you are growing in holiness now and the means by which you do that again is by the indwelling presence of the holy spirit of god Chapter 8, verse 30 and 29. 38 and 29. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Right, so hold right there. Look at this. That's the scope of salvation. He predestined you. He called you. He justified you. But what follows justification? Sanctification. Notice how Paul is logically moving through his argument here. And certainly he's using it in the past tense to emphasize the certainty of your victory. He also justified. And what follows justification ultimately will be your glorification. But between your justification and your glorification is your growing in holiness, your sanctification. Verse 38 and 39. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing would be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You all get that? So our sanctification, the certainty of our salvation, nothing and nobody would ever be able to separate us from God. And Paul uses what? The word to express our being kept by God. He uses the word love. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. I'm convinced neither death, nor life, nor angels, principalities, things present, nor things to come, nor powers, height, depth, any other thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in who? Christ Jesus. Why did he say Christ Jesus? Because we have salvation in Jesus. 
and then the Holy Spirit indwelling within us, the resource to put to death the deeds of the flesh. We grow in holiness. We have the certainty of being glorified. And because this is such a certain and sure and secure salvation, he says here in verse 8, chapter 8, verse 38, nothing will be able to separate us, verse 38 and 39, from the love of God. Isn't this an encouraging thing here? But we see the logic of Paul's argument. Okay, block four, sovereignty. Um, page chapter 9, verse 6, 8, and 15. Mm -hmm. It gets sensitive here. Um, but if it is not as though, sorry, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Uh, nor are they all children because they are Abram's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be named. All right. Verse 8. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. But the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. But who are the children of the promise? These are the ones whom God chose for salvation. Look at verse 15. Paul, and this is the section here that deals with justification of God in the eyes of sinners. Is God unjust? Is God unjust in choosing whom he will? Listen to verse 15. Pastor the group. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. You all hear that? God reserves to himself. I remember Archie Sproul put it like this. He is not obligated to give his grace to everyone. God reserves to himself the sovereign right to be merciful to whomever he wills. And to the rest, he would give justice. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Chapter 10 and verse 12. God doesn't distinguish between the Jew and the Greek. Look at verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding mm -hmm. in riches for all who call upon him. Right, so there's no distinction. Again, what did we see in the beginning here? Jew and Gentile. No distinction. All accountable all have salvation in Christ. They would all be justified by faith. They will have holiness by the means of the Holy Spirit and by the sovereignty of God. There is no distinction. All who call on him. But who are the ones that call on him? The ones whom he chose. The sovereignty of God is on display here. This is what Paul is explaining. Chapter 10, verse 13 through 15. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him to whom, sorry, in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? All right. So what, we know that God predestines. And we just saw in chapter 8 that those whom he predestined, he calls. How do they call on him? How does God call his people? For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how will they call on him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a? So who is the one that does the preaching to call sinners to repentance? The means by which God calls his people through the proclamation of his word. We need the, the instrument of the, the preacher. But nevertheless, it is the sovereign call of God to the sinner, but it is the instrument of the preacher who proclaims the word of God. That is the, that's the way that God calls sinners to repentance. All right. Last and I would say very, very sensitive and controversial block, chapter 11, because there's so many divisions concerning this. This is concerning Israel, the nation of Israel. Okay. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, 
a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, verse 7. Mm -hmm. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Emphasis, chosen. So he's saying, I say that God has not rejected his people. That's possessive. The people who belong to him. And what then? What Israel is seeking, meaning righteousness, Israel has not obtained. But those who were those who were chosen obtained, and the rest were hardened. This is why he said in the preceding chapters, God said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on those whom I have compassion. Meaning he will choose whom would receive this righteousness. That's what verse 7 is saying. What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. Only those who were chosen by God, whom he called, those are the ones who would obtain said righteousness. And again, there is no salvation and no righteousness apart from who? Jesus Christ. Final block. So we see, so let's back up and then we'll go to the last block here. We recall we had this sin problem. Jew and Gentile. Notice in the sovereignty section in chapter 11, we're talking about Israel. There's not the Jews. Notice how Paul makes this theme of Jew and Gentile recur throughout. Notice how you say that everybody are sinners and the only way of salvation is in Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile, and we all receive holiness, and the only way we could grow in holiness is through the Holy Spirit working within us, and all of this is based on what? The sovereignty of God. God is the one who calls sinners to repentance, and that is why we believe that salvation is holy and only a work of who? God. So in response to all of this great salvation here from chapter 1 to chapter 11, we are called to do what? Let's go to chapter 12 now. 12 through 16. The response to the salvation that we have, this great salvation. Almost done. Verses 3 to 6. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among... Actually, read from verse, from, read verse 1 and then go to 3. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service, service of, of worship. worship. So what is our response to this? What is the life that we are called to? A life of service. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, not a dead one. You're no longer dead in your sins. You're a living sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, in the Greek text, you will see logical, logical service or logical worship. What Paul is saying there, it is only reasonable or logical that you respond as offering yourself as a living sacrifice in response to the mercies of God that has been expressed to you. You give yourself in service. Go ahead, Hans. Verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, one body. and all the members mm -hmm. do not have the same function, mm -hmm. so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Right. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to... Right, so stop there. Each of us is to do what? Exercise them accordingly. So in our service of worship, we are members, we recognize that we are all members of one body. We are the members of the body of who? Jesus Christ. So we're going back to him. And he said that we are all gifted. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. And each of us is to do what? Exercise them accordingly for the purpose of offering yourself as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual service of worship. And in chapter 12, you'll just see, he starts like, you know, from within. Know that you are within Christ, we are all members of the body, and then you serve the members of the body. But in your service, we jump over now to chapter 13. What does chapter 13 and verse 1 says? Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, 
and those who exist are established by God. All right, so in our service to God, every person is to do what? Be in subjection to the governing authorities. Not just within your household, not just, not just within the church of God among the brethren. We honor and we respect the authority, the governing authorities. Amen? Right. So this is service by subjection to the government. Now, chapter 14 and verse 1, and chapter 15, 1 and verse 2. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, mm -hmm. but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Right, so that's accept the one who is weak. That is the weak brother. So this is still our service to each other here. Now there may be brethren who may have sensitive issues that they may be weak in concerning the faith. And Paul is instructing us here, we are to do what? Accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. We work alongside our fellow brethren so as to help them to grow out of their weaknesses. 15. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Mm -hmm. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. But hold on, isn't that the second table of the law? The first four commandments is about honoring God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what's the second block? To love your neighbor as yourself. So we go back and observe what the law of God requires of us. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his own good. We who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just to please ourselves. We have to remember that concerning our brethren. And lastly, 16 and verse 1 and 2. I commend you, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you. For she herself has also been a helper of many, and of myself as well. Right, good. So we see Paul is calling them in their service to each other to receive Phoebe just as she was also a servant. Receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. Help her in whatever need she may have. So we see in here, we serve each other, worthy of the saints, whatever help that we could give, as just as how she was a servant too. So the whole idea of service was fraught from chapter 12 to chapter 16. So let's wrap it up. Time is up. Problem of sin is dealt with through salvation, we grow in holiness. We see it's all based on the sovereignty of God. And the life that we are called to live is a life of service. That's the book of Romans in a nutshell. Let's pray. Our gracious Father and our God, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for this great book, Lord God, that Paul contributed to the canon of Scripture. We pray and ask that you help us to remember what was said here, O Lord, and take us into a deeper understanding of these truths. And Lord, may we serve you wholeheartedly and never be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. We give you thanks for all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, we are definitely out of time, so we could go downstairs for our refreshments, and then we'll come back up.